Michael Campbell's fine. Michael Campbell is fine. Cool. Um, well, Michael Campbell, thank you for being the first uh, Portland artist that I'm going to be interviewing. Uh, it's it's an honor to have you on on the show. It's my pleasure, William. Welcome to Portland. Yeah, thank you. I think it's funny how we're both from the Bay Area, and we both came up here at the relatively the same time. You moved up here two months ago, and I moved up here four days ago. And uh, yeah, it's just always nice to it's always nice to run into someone who's from from your area because you feel like you kind of you have this uh, mutual similarity Mm -hmm. being from the same area yeah so yeah and we're also kind of dropped into this very new place it's very different kind of for me it feels so different and so foreign here that i feel like i'm in another country sometimes um like the the weather here has been so amazing when we first arrived in late february it was still snowing occasionally we would wake up to snow and then it would rain during the day then it would hail like there's the changes in the weather um just within 24 hour cycle were amazing yeah 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 it's uh it's different you know i remember looking at the weather app and and seeing that there was gonna be so much rain but then i kind of timed it so that i would start nice but then i didn't realize that just because it says on the weather app it's not going to rain doesn't mean that it's going to be sunny because we have these overcast days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these overcast days, which are, are also new to me. But my family back in the Bay Area say that it's pretty overcast there right now, too, mm. in Sacramento and Berkeley and San Francisco. So the weather just seems to be all over the place, climate change and everything like that. Um, but cool. So uh, I found you uh, on Instagram and I came across your mushroom uh, inspired art, which is, uh, really, it stood out to me. It's like immediate, like, wow, this guy has, I mean, we were just saying before we started, like you have a niche that is super defined. Can you, um, tell me how you, you even got involved with mushrooms and why it's like, seems like it's such a strong force in your work. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like, um, Psychedelic mushrooms are almost a, a rite of passage for people. I, most people that I know, when you're in college, you experiment with them. And I did when I was in art school. I took them. I, um, my first experience was <clears throat> at a friend's farm in Kansas. And we went out, we, I drove out to his farm. I had helped him with um, doing some work on the farm and he wanted to repay me with a, a mushroom experience, my first one. So I took them with him and um, it was, the first experience was very eye-opening. I think my first experience must have been probably my best um, because it was, it just really made me see things in a way that I'd never saw them before. And just so immersed, especially like doing it on somebody's farm. Mm. Um, you're just so immersed in nature and I'm like going on small hikes around the farm. Um, you're, I'm watching trees and the trees are look like they are growing in front of me. I can see branches sort of moving and growing. Yeah. There are cows across the gravel road from me. It sounds like they're singing to me. Like they're like... It was, yeah, it was just incredible. Like, it just really made you feel this connection um, to the world and especially to nature. Um, mm-hmm. So that that was my, my um, probably the most profound experience um, was the first one. And it's really made me interested in exploring that to some degree. Um, so I tried psychedelics in college and um i my approach to it in the past was more um i mean it's it's really influenced my art when i was in grad school um especially mu- taking mushrooms um the work became very odd and psychedelic i think my my um faculty who were working with me were a little bit puzzled by my work took a different direction. I came yeah. from the Midwest and I was doing work that was really in, oops, 
that I was really influenced by um, by nature there, by yeah. wood carving. I was making things out of walnut and carving skulls and making these giant structures out of found found branches and things like that. So it was very mm-hmm. um, sculptural, like nature sculpture type stuff. And I yeah. went to Tucson for grad school and the nature in Tucson. Have you been to Arizona before? I drove through on a road trip, but I've never really spent a lot of time there. No. The, the Sonoran Desert there in Tucson is just incredible. But it's, and it's so different and so alien to mm-hmm. what I'd, I'd ever seen. I, was, I mean, I was really kind of a kind of a small town Midwestern 25 year old who went to Tucson to grad school. So it was really yeah. eye opening. It was a mixing of different cultures that I hadn't really seen. Um, and the, the flora and the fauna in the Sonoran, De- Sonoran Desert were it's just so inspirational. Like my, the place that I live really um, affects the work that I do. And when I left the Midwest and went to the, to the desert, the desert is different. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have a heavy forest or things like that. It doesn't have a lot of grass. But it has a lot of life, and it's just incredible. And everything is so spiky and spiny with all the cacti, and there are animals there that are beautiful. There are the animals that are, that are dangerous and venomous, mm. and I mean, all that stuff is really influential. And just the aesthetic of the Southwest was inf- influential as well. Like the, the cultures there I began to absorb certain things um, that were available to me, being influenced by different materials that were available. Um, I was working with things like, like faux, I was mixing like faux fur with synthetic things. Like the, the psychedelics that I, that I was experimenting with in grad school really made me look at things through a, a psychedelic lens. And I kind of left behind the, the stuff that I'd been doing in Kansas and change things quite a bit to reflect that so that was a transition period huh from the stuff you've been doing before what were you doing before in kansas before you had moved the kind of themes Um, of your work and the kind of stuff you were doing because i heard in the podcast with javier that you had experimented with painting but it was always kind of mm, a struggle for you like with working in that medium and you always felt like there were you felt called to more of the sculptural stuff. Yeah, I mean, oddly enough, my, my undergrad degree is in painting. I finished it in painting, but by the mm-hmm. time, by my last semester in undergrad school, I was in sculpture every day. Like, I was just like, I don't, I'm not that into painting anymore. Mm-hmm. It just, I don't know, it, it's just the way I think. And I think very three-dimensionally, and I like working with my hands. I like to be engaged with things. I like the, the meditative process of making stuff with your hands Mm -hmm. i like to problem solve in that way i like to build things um so sculpture just really opened my eyes to a different way of working and a different way of being creative i was i was really when i was painting it tightened me up because you sort of had this blank canvas and i was going through and i was like drawing things out before i paint whereas my friends were more loose and they would like they would just start like slapping paint on and kind of find yeah. their way whereas I would have to be like very tight with it and like draw it out exactly and then paint within the lines and this it, I was never a good painter I was always mediocre but I was better at sculpture because it just, it just really activated my mind in a different way plus I was really I was really drawn to the sculpture department because everybody there was so independent they're they were able to do things. They were able to fix things. They were, you know, if there was a problem with, if they were, I mean, if they had to plumb, if they, if they had to bring in um, gas or welding, they were good at that. They were good at electricity. You know, I just, I really vibed with that, with people in sculpture more. Um, mm. It made me, it just made me grow more in terms of my technical skills and my craft. It just, it challenged me more to, yeah, I and also the work that I'd been doing in the Midwest was more. It was sculptural, but it was involved with wood, and found 
branches and things like that. So it was mm -hmm. it was a little bit more loose in that way. Whereas when I went to Arizona, I just was surrounded by so many talented people that I needed to challenge myself to to learn technical skills that I hadn't really learned in painting department. You know, painting department was just was just painting. It was making you you made your stretchers, you stretch your canvas, and then you paint. You know, and whereas in yeah. sculpture, it just opened up a the world of tools to me and mm -hmm. and yeah. <laughs> technology too right yeah. a lot of a lot of different pieces of equipment especially nowadays i mean i just I was on youtube and i saw this uh new thing that came out of i think italy or france where they're actually able to carve in stone now on marble using like machines and oh, stuff okay and they're like 3d render it in a program and they can scar they can actually like create marble sculptures like michelangelo or something but with a machine, which is wild. Um, Our time as artists is limited now, I think. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Another way is like it's it kind of helps with the output. I think there was a they had a kind of a discussion on it, and one of the perspectives I liked was that like even Michelangelo had assistants, mm -hmm. and so like the idea of a robot being like an assistant for like the concept of of it yeah. is uh, was made sense to me but um I'm, ki I'm kidding by the way about our time being limited i feel like it's people who are artists are they're capable of growing around obstacles um yeah. cre creativity demands that you um you push beyond that challenge so um what is happening with technology now will challenge us to grow as artists and move in different ways i think you know to i think it will help us in certain ways i think it's it, i i i think there are problems with with ai but i think that there are i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about with that <laughs> yeah i'd love to i'd love to talk more about the ai thing um, can we shelf that for now though until later? Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to focus on you and your your artwork. So one of the first questions I always like to ask is like for people who are just um, who aren't familiar with you and they're watching this interview, like how would you describe your your art and your your style of of your work? Um, it's all three D mixed media sculpture. Um, everything is inspired by uh, nature, by mycology, by um, my love for mushrooms and going out into nature and um, that immersion. Um, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's trying to bring, um, it's trying to, I'm trying to connect people with nature on the same level that I see it through the lens of psychedelics in a way. Okay. Um, and the importance of that connection. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense when I, when I look at your work. Um, as someone who's taken uh, mushrooms. So the themes of your work... Um, on your website, actually, it seems like a lot of it is, is most mostly new stuff that I'm that I was seeing at least. I don't know if you do that intentionally to keep it always fresh, but it was like 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, a lot of your sculptural work that's on there, and also in the eating eating gallery website, I think of themes like you're saying, like nature, um, of like death slash um, kind of the renewal of of like thing like life t taking over mm -hmm. um like even in your most recent uh uh series that you did with like the gun there's like the gun and then there's the nature that's kind of consuming the gun mm -hmm. and uh, i see that theme a lot of like nature kind of taking back um the whatever was done before like there's an event that happens, a human caused event or some other event, and then nature comes. It's like always nature coming back and like taking or consuming and and uh, 
re- redoing that. So are, is, am I right in, in thinking that that's a, a major theme? And are there any other like major themes besides like death and, and the natural world and, and stuff like that? Yeah, it's, I mean, you've, you've really hit it on the head with that, that show, which was, that was Eternal Return. And the theme was, a lot of the theme was um, thinking about a world without us, thinking about um, a world where we have disappeared. And the idea is um, natura, naturans, which means um, nature doing what nature does, um, or nature nature doing nature in a way um and okay. it's the idea of nature finds a way no matter what you know what i mean um with with the tools with the implements um i mean there were there's there's axes there's guns there's saws there's things a lot of things that have a um There's some things that I want to talk about, and there's some things that I want to be careful not to talk about, too. Okay. Um, I want to be careful, like, what I get myself into with the conversation. Um, like with saying that you've taken substances publicly? I don't care or, about that. I just, no. I, there's certain themes in the work that I want to be careful about. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to, like, be careful how I say it. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, so we're talking about... Um, um, the weapons, the tools, and nature retaking them, nature reclaiming them, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, with that, with a, a lot of those, it's it's sort of the surreal twist of, say, an axe um, being rendered useless, hanging on the wall, but then the wood of the axe handle um, is covered in lichen and biology and fungi and is now regrowing branches and sort of returning to um nature returning to what it was and it's you know what what was an implement that was um used to take nature take resources has now returned to nature in a way Mm -hmm. um yeah so it's i mean it's kind of a look at at the at a world without us and what you know, what will happen to the world if we don't make it, essentially. Mm-hmm. Would you consider your, your art to be like climate activism as well? Or is it more focused on just the, th- the theme of renewal? Um, yeah, ecology is, is important in my work for sure. Um, my main focus though is on people and their connection to the natural world and seeing it through a different lens um understanding our connection to that world understanding our interconnectedness to each other and sort of what we do to to nature we do to ourselves Mm, mm mm-hmm Yeah, because we are nature, right? What's that? Because we are nature, right? Of course we are. Yeah. yeah. It, at some point, that idea got lost, and we thought that we were separate from nature. We thought that we were above nature, in a mm-hmm. way. Um, that nature was ours to take. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of like reminds me of like the idea of like conversations I had when I was in philosophy school of, of some people thinking that like humans are special and we have like this divine gift from God for our intellect mm-hmm. and, and there's that perspective. And then so then kind of like what you're saying, like then we have the right to kind of domineer over nature and use it for our own personal gain or satisfaction. And there's the other perspective that like you look at like a, a bat that has sonar 
or like a whale that has its own like like communication system and like it has its own sense sensory system and its own experience Mm -hmm. it's like it just makes me think of like the question of like are we that special or is it just we have this specific capacity for intellect and that's and and pattern recognition and thinking that's unique but not necessarily like makes us better Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah where do you stand on that That's a really big question. Um, <laughs> like I said, sometimes I have to think a little bit before I answer. Um, I mean, a lot of trying to answer your question, um, a lot of what I'm doing when I'm connecting um, Judeo Christian iconography with psychedelics and with mushrooms um, that's it's sort of a metaphor working on multiple levels um, it's for me I mean I, I went to I went to church I went to Sunday school I went to vacation Bible school and all that stuff as a kid my, my folks were very strict with me and they brought me up um, in this Protestant based um, Midwestern church um, so that's really influenced my thinking. Um, going to church, though, my experience going to church was not really a good one. I had some bad experiences going to church. Um, so I, I questioned it when I was 16, and I left the church. And my dad was really very disappointed in that. But my the idea that I'm that I'm putting forth with the work that I'm doing is it's a blending of that spirituality uh with psychedelics and i mean what i'm when i'm middle-aged now um and i can kind of see things sort of the arc of life and seeing where i stand now with that trying to find um the good in that spirituality and sort of like taking the best and leaving the rest with it um but finding through through the mushroom, I found a spirituality that I felt was more of a direct connection. There wasn't sort of the middleman in church. I feel like the communion with psilocybin and with the mushroom is more of a direct line of communication with something that is whatever that is greater than us. Um, it's something that is a benevolent voice that seems to want to teach you know it psilocybin is my teacher um it teaches me to work on myself to be a better person to be more creative to be more emotionally evolved as well um so that's that spiritual connection is coming through in my work and what i'm saying is that through psychedelics i feel a greater wholeness in my life i feel that sort of wholeness that i felt that you feel through sometimes through a your connection to God, to Christ, or to whoever you you might worship. Um, but like I say, I'm taking the best and leaving the rest with that. I'm also thinking about the teachings of the Ju- Judeo-Christian text and um, the idea of controlling nature or nature being something that should be controlled um you know in in the way that nothing you know what what is wild anymore you know in california like what is there any wild space or is it all sort of controlled in a way um So I, what I'm what I'm saying with that is um, sorry I'm distracted. I, I, I it's getting I, sunny finally. It's beautiful, <laughs> and I 
I feed the crows out there. I throw peanuts out there all the time. Oh, yeah. And they have started to come to visit. Like, they come and they they will sit in the tree and they'll call out and ask for them. And I'll go out and I'll throw peanuts out and then oh, they'll, they'll come down and eat them. Crows are smart. They're amazing. Yeah, they're super conniving. I, it was crazy. I was going on a walk with my girlfriend in Berkeley, like, the week before I left. And we, we saw the most wild thing. A crow swooped into a tree we saw this whole thing from start to finish swooped into a tree and plucked a baby bird by the back of its neck yeah and flew away with it and it was like like, oh my god (laughs) that crow is about to go eat like i had never seen that in my life and we had to look it up we're like yeah they're carnivores or they're omnivores it's like whoa savage (laughs) yeah nature is is brutal sometimes you know Um, yeah it's, yeah, it's it's a hard truth um, for us to to understand that sometimes we, because we live so far removed from it. We live in mm-hmm. our own little um, bubble worlds, and we pretend that we're not really a part of nature. Like that nature is something that you go out to on the weekends to see. You know, you go for your yeah. hikes or you go experience it. Um, in the zoo or whatever that might be you know so it's it's part of what i'm doing is um finding that that immersion and acceptance into what we really are what our history is um where we came from um and the possibility of what psychedelics can do for us now um, as far as evolving like emotionally evolving as people Mm -hmm. yeah I feel like I'm really off track from the question I've forgotten the question I guess we're talking about um, um, we're talking about the connection of nature Judeo-Christian attitude towards nature and sort of um, subjugating it um but, and I feel like there's this, it's sort of a, an external subjugation and control of nature, but it's also an internal one, like control of who you are and who yeah. you should be and, and not really, not allowing nature to be what it is in you sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's like it's, everyone has a shadow to them, sort of a shadow side to them. Mm-hmm. And... A lot of us avoid that shadow all of our lives, sort of suppress that and keep that away. And I feel like, you know, like I said, natura naturans, nature doing what nature does, nature finds a way. And that is that shadow in you. It's sort of like understanding who you really are and embracing that shadow and doing shadow work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've heard that. that- not to get too off top, off off hand, because I have a lot of questions about your art. But just to talk oh, about the shadow, sorry. <laughs> just to talk. Well, I mean, it's there's I, as I was preparing for this interview, there's so much overlap between um, uh, whether you realize it or not, which I know you do realize. But just to say that, like your your art is also like awareness for psychedelics, and it's kind of part of this psychedelic movement that's happening right now, really predominantly across like the coasts like the Pacific Northwest and like New York and some of the other places, but like really progressive areas, just like a, a re, the revival of interest in, in psychedelics. And so I feel like your art is playing a part in that. And so a lot, understandably, like a lot of this conversation will be about psychedelics and stuff. So like you're, you're, when you talk about the shadow, like that, that's interesting. Cause I, um, don't like, I don't, I don't feel like that's common, um, knowledge. And for a long, a long time, even like, you know, we both grew up in the Bay and like I, or you grew up in Virginia, but like we're both from the Bay. Kansas. 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 Oh, okay. 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 Kansas. <laughs> not the Bay. Not Virginia. Um, just like it was, it was, uh, what am I saying? I just heard that, that word, the shadow a lot. Right. And I didn't really know what it meant. But I think as I've gotten older and like been more interested in psychology and stuff, the idea is that the shadow is just parts of yourself that are there, 
parts of myself that are there and it's like it just keeps happening like an example is like me comparing myself to another person and being like i'm better than that other person or like oh i wish i was or more envious like i wish i was more like that person whether it's like status or like beauty or money or something like that and there's kind of like that dark side of me and it's like is that me or is that just something like thoughts that are just intruding like where is that coming from um is that how how you kind of see the shadow and and the work with taking psychedelics is to kind of unravel that because i know a lot of like the religious stuff preaches to not be um like envious or or comparing yourself to others and a lot of like self-improvement stuff says the same stuff like don't compare yourself to others compare yourself to just yourself and try to be better Mm. Yeah, um, this is true. I, for me, so the, so shadow work for me has been. I mean, I've been working with um, someone who's a men. He, I, I would say therapist. I would say also counselor, but he's much more than that. He's he's a mentor to me. I mean, we talk about you know when we talk, we talk about me, but we also talk about philosophy and we talk about how we how I look at the world and, and how my my vision of the world has shifted to some degree. But the shadow work that I've, I mean, I've been working with him for like almost 20 years now. So he, the person that I work with for that, knows me probably better than anyone else on this earth right now. And the shadow work has just been bringing up, I feel like nobody escapes childhood without some sort of baggage or trauma. Everybody carries something with them from the past that really affects them every day affects their relationships with other people and so forth and i for me i i I managed to avoid a lot of the stuff that i've worked on for a long time but my my parents died in the past um five six years they died within five years of each other and that was a that was a big transition for me to move uh, through that because I've, I'm their only child so now my entire family is gone um, my new family is my wife and, and her extended family but um, I totally lost some train of thought sorry um, talking about family oh shadow work shadow work um Yeah, my brain is it's like it has holes in it from smoking so much weed like a bit like the thoughts just they go there and then they just like mm. but um talking about the shadow um it just it just means um to me dealing head on with um past baggage in my life a dealing dealing with it, addressing it, acknowledging it, you know, acknowledging things that happened to you in the past, you know, were out of your control and and um I don't know, it just it just doing the shadow work with the help of psychedelics, with the help of cannabis sometimes has helped me to move um forward more quickly in my own healing process. Mm-hmm. Are there any other things that you've done that have been been helpful with that? Um, one thing that stands out to me that which has been much more useful for uh, than like past therapists I've seen is just journaling and like sitting down to journaling and like I realize I have resistance around that because it's almost like there's a part of me that knows that's like really good for me. <laughs> you know cuz I'll like I'll come to like epiphanies I'm like oh now I got to now I got to integrate that and like crap that's a really good idea or something you know yeah kind of like with the food the, you know the other time like there's no there's no secret solution man you just got to you just got to stop using food to numb yourself yeah you know just stuff like that it's like crap now I have to now I have to actually work on that yeah um you know, are there any things like that that come to mind besides just the, the psychedelics? Um, I 
I mean, it's it's been it's been psychedelics. It's, it's also getting out in nature as well has been a big help. Like sort of the hikes, the my interest in mushrooms has really in mycology has really grown since I moved from San Francisco itself and I had moved out to North Bay and there was we were closer to nature there. So it was easier to sort of get out on the weekend and go for a drive and go for a hike and go and hunt mushrooms. So I just, you know, it's I, the feeling you have from the calmness that comes over you from getting out into nature and going for a hike and and studying it, like looking at it closely, like getting out and like finding a mushroom, finding an omnium muscaria, the giant red cap that's sometimes as big as a dinner plate. You know, yeah. it's just it's just mind blowing. Yeah. You know? So Do to people me, eat those things. I think I saw a Vice documentary. I might be misremembering this, but I saw a Vice doc on. Uh, I don't know if you know Hamilton Morris. Mm-hmm. He's like a journalist there. Mm-hmm. Um, he did like a, I think he went and ate one of those things. Yeah, I saw that the that um, episode. He ventured to the um, is it Carpathian uh, Mountains. Oh yeah. Um, anyway, he yeah, I saw him that episode, and they were taking. Um, um, and scary mushrooms and they were I think putting them in jars of vodka and like pickling them something absurd like that yeah yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it was interesting I I love to hunt the almonitas I love to find them um, I'll bring some of them home to studio to study them and photograph them and look very I mean it's it's really to look very closely at them while I'm trying to sculpt them like having them in studio is just amazing. Looking at how the the geometry of the gills and how they're how they're in an array from the center of the the stem of the mushroom and the cap. And mm. but answering your question, like have I tried them? Um, I just like from what I read about the Amanita, it doesn't really sound like what I'm looking for. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's it's from what I read, it's more. Like a drunken, disorienting feeling, which I'm I'm looking more for clarity, not yeah. to feel kind of blunted and yeah. rounded in that way. I didn't even know you could eat them, actually. Like I thought they were poisonous, but there's they... yeah, there's a big fear of them, but you can prepare them in a certain way. You you can dry them out, um, and I guess you can make a tea from them. Mm. Um, but there's a process that you have to go through, apparently. Um, <clears throat> To render them, um, like they they'll give you intestinal issues. Um, yeah. So you have to sort of render there's um, botanic acid and I think muscimol in them, and you have to, you know the you know the old um, mythology about the the reindeer and the and the omnita, right? No. There's a there's a myth about um, I think Siberian shamans. Um, and the idea of the origin of Santa Claus, the connection between the the red and white Amanita muscaria, and connecting that to the um, the Santa Claus's attire, his his red velvety suit with the white trim, is a connection to that supposedly. Mm. But also, if you the the myth says that the shaman um, would take the Amanita, and then he would piss it out, and then the the members of his group would drink the piss because it would filter out some of the toxins, apparently. Oh, wow. And also the idea was that reindeer in this area loved the Amanita, and they would eat them, and then they would um, have some sort of an experience, and that was the idea of, like, reindeer flying. Mm. Or, oh, wow. Or yeah. T- or taking, That's where that came from? Yeah. Or taking... Supposedly. I It's... Yeah, it's a bit of a stretch for me. It, yeah, it's it doesn't quite dovetail <laughs> perfectly for me. So yeah. I kind of look. I look at all these things with with interest, but yeah. I but I'm never quite sure about them. Sure. Really. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's funny how because I know that you have. Um, I saw that some of your your mushroom art is 
psilocybin based because it has the blue gills mm-hmm. underneath it. But the bruising, uh, yeah. But Amanita muscaria um, also plays a large role. Is that just because they're so pretty? Because they are really pretty. They're, they're just they're so red. iconic. Do you know what I mean? They're just, yeah. They just they they send that message um, so clearly, and they they just they connect so many different things between like you know Super Mario. Um, and taking the mushroom to grow bigger, um, Alice in Wonderland. Um, you know, I mean, maybe I, I don't know. I haven't tried Amanita. Maybe it is what people say it is, but I, I just have been very resistant to it. There's also there was also um, I think it was Gordon Lawson who was um, maybe an ethnobotanist. I assume in the 1950s he traveled to um, I think Oaxaca in search of um, uh, psilocybin and um, the story with that. And he traveled there and he met Maria Sabina, who was a uh, curandera and she worked with the mushroom and he, I guess, had an experience through her and then brought that information back to the U.S. But he also wrote a book where he was in search of um, Soma. Mm. Um, And... I want to say, if I, if I remember right, Soma is, um, it's the magic intoxicant. It's connected with the the Vedas, I think, if I remember right. But anyway, he okay. was, he. no one knows what Soma was. Soma was this this magical intoxicant that they took f- for, um, for visions. It, um, but it wasn't written down, so no one knows what it was. And Gordon Wasson proposed that this was the Omnia muscaria mushroom. Mm. Um, Interesting. Probably not, but um, that's what he... It, there's, there's just so much um, mythology wrapped around that mushroom that it's, it's, just, it's really a charged image to use for me. Yeah. Interesting. Soma. I feel like I've heard that before. What culture? You said Hindu culture? I believe so, yeah. The, okay. The Veda, Vedics. The Vedics, yeah, that's their kind of religious texts, right? Vedics, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's also just a very pretty mushroom. But have you um, found them while hiking before? Um, never. I've never seen them. No, I've seen uh, in in uh, the Bay Area. I've seen the blue gills ones and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's psilocybin, but I don't want to risk it because I'm not a mycologist, you know, because <laughs> I know they can look very similar and people can poison themselves. So I'm like freaked out by that. But I've seen so many times where the mushrooms are growing out of uh, my hometown. There were hikes in the hills, cows would roam, cow patties, and they would just come right out in like big amounts. Yeah. Um, so I saw a lot of potentially uh, the magic ones, but never, and I didn't even know they grew in in uh, California. The Almanitas? Yeah, the oh, red yeah. ones. They yeah. do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> They're seasonal. Um, they they seem like they pop up more in um, into early winter. I see them like November, December in some places. Mm-hmm. Um, January. I've even seen them as late as, as March at one point um, back in the Bay Area. But it's just really, it's just so mind-blowing to be walking on a trail somewhere and suddenly just see this this giant pop of red or yeah my wife, my wife and I'll be we'll just be driving down down the road just kind of like scanning scanning because they grow sometimes they just grow like right next to the road and there's this giant wow. pop of red suddenly hit the brakes and go yeah and investigate wow yeah that'd be really cool I, I feel like I should have seen one if I've lived in California this long so they must be uh, really seasonal or I just haven't been looking hard enough yeah, it's they come out when it's cold and after the rains usually. So it's it's usually a winter thing. Mm. And the, and I guess hence sometimes the connection between Christmas and and the Omnita as well. Uh, I mean, you, like it's you see old Christmas cards and Christmas postcards, um, particularly from Scandinavia, that will have um, like like good jewel like. Um, you know, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, but with um, this Omnina muscaria mushroom and maybe a little elf wheeling out in a wheelbarrow. Like that was very, for a period of time, was a very common um, symbolism 
Mm. Um, yeah, and it's it's interesting. Like it's trying trying to piece together why this this mushroom is so prevalent in our minds. Well, okay, we're back from a break, and uh, uh, I want to thank you on the video for this amazing, <laughs> amazingly accurate and uh, really cool mushroom, uh, psilocybin mushroom that looks real. Like if I place it down and kind of just look at it, it looks like a giant version of a mushroom because the texture on, on the stem especially is just so lifelike. Um, yeah, I wish I could get closer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this. You're so welcome. Yeah. Do you, do you sell individual ones like this too? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Sometimes. Oh, that's so cool. On your website, if people wanted to find it. Yeah. I tend to do things in bursts, you know, like I'll make a bunch of them and then I'll say, these are, these are coming up and I'm going to put these out, you know, on such and such a date. But yeah. I, I Sometimes I have to focus on other things, so it's hard. It's really it's hard being an independent artist to yeah to juggle and balance all these things, like to to be present on your social media, to run your store, mm -hmm. to um, to pack things up properly and ship them and get them to their destination. Um, especially with sculpture, it's really it's been really challenging to get things across the country in one piece. Um, Have you had pieces break on you? I had a few, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's really, it's just, it's heartbreaking because, um, you know, how do you fix them? Like, I, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's been a real challenge. Um, I just, I have to, every time I make a piece, I, there's a balance between, um, making it look and feel delicate, but making it as like trying to engineer it as strong as I can to make it like a tank. So if I have mm -hmm. to put it in a crate <laughs> yeah. and send it across the country, yeah. then it makes it in one piece. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. No, I imagine that for sculpt for sculpture, especially independent sculpture -ers, that would be a, a dilemma for shipping and stuff like that. Um, it's, yeah, I was gonna say that. Like, it's being a painter first, and then being a, a sculptor later on. Um, you, you, from what I notice, you take on a whole nother layer of challenges to be a, a sculptor. Um, you need more space. You need more tools. Um, you know, it costs more money um, to for that space, the, the, the a space you can work in is hard to find sometimes because you're working with weird materials and sometimes toxic materials. Mm -hmm. um, and then shipping things is always a you know a difficult trying to get you know pack a piece perfectly so it won't break um, versus like trying to pack a painting. I find it easier to ship two D work than three D work. Yeah, yeah. How do you get ideas? Like, can you walk me through your, your brainstorming process? Do you like to sit down and kind of like have coffee and maybe smoke a little weed and just like kind of think about ideas in your head? Or are you more of a hands-on person tinkering and making stuff? It varies. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> I come at it from um, different approaches. Um, and I have different sort of tools for finding inspiration. Um, one of those tools is just going for a walk and just sort of like letting random things enter into the equation, you know, or like particularly like in Portland, like living here, living, living in this neighborhood, it's just so lush and beautiful. So that's finding inspiration through walking and clearing my head, um, through sketching, like daily sketching, um, like you said, maybe some coffee, maybe some cannabis. And I find... I. My sketching sometimes is, um, it's very free form. I will just, it's almost like if you were, say, you were on the phone with somebody and you had a pen in your hand and you've got a magazine or whatever and you just start doodling. Like it's, it's almost like you just say, just begin. You don't know where you're going, but just begin to draw a shape. 
And I just be, you know, I, I used to play a game with another artist that I knew. And we would draw like, we get on a dry erase board and we'd draw like three lines, four lines, anywhere, any way. And then the other guy mm-hmm. would take the, the marker and would have to do a drawing out of that. So like, it's, it's kind of like, it's like finding, it's just, it's just beginning, just beginning to draw something and then finding that form and that shape and letting it become something um, and just kind of letting your, letting your mind go. So a lot, of, a lot of my drawings are kind of weird, kind of psychedelic in a way, but also they, they are um, like sort of engineering ideas, like how to make this thing, how to put this piece together, how to, you know, what do I need to pour something into the core for strength? Do I need to put a um, a steel rod in it? Um, You know, things like that. So it's, it's working out, it's, it's brainstorming, being loose initially, but then also the engineering of the piece and drawing it as well. Um, Other things that I do for inspiration, you know, just sort of, just letting any sort of random, um, inspiration um into your brain into your um into your eyes Mm. for me going just going walking going shopping going to a hardware store um just walking up and down the aisles not really having a clear idea what i need but sort of like seeing things and imagining can i put these things together to make this i i taught this this is on a tangent, but I taught mm. this class for about 20 years called um, Design Problem Solving. And a lot of the crux of the class was trying to engage students to be creative and think about problems in new ways with new perspectives. And part of that is this sort of randomizing of information and putting things together that you wouldn't normally imagine. Um, Something else that I do, um, I have, I'm organized in my studio, I have a lot of bins. I'll have bins of like random plastic part, bins of um, styrofoam spheres, bins of um, disco balls, bins of random uh, driftwood. So Mm -hmm. there's, there's, each one has sort of a, an element of material to it. And sometimes I'll just pull bins out of the wall and I'll just say, how do I make these things fit together? You know, mm-hmm. How do I make that work? These things wouldn't normally want to be together in a piece, but I'm gonna make them feel like they belong in a way, you know, and that's the yeah. challenge to me. And that really sort of, it really gets things moving for me. like that push of like trying to imagine how to put things together that way Mm -hmm. does that make sense it does make sense yeah it's reminded me a lot of an interview i had with uh javier manrique i think it was like the third second or third episode i had where he would literally his whole studio was filled with i was kind of poking fun at him because he told me he was a minimalist but we go into a studio and he has all these like trinkets and things like a wooden duck over here and a plunger over here and like a bicycle wheel over here I'm like what is all this stuff and he's like oh I just like to stare at this and get ideas by kind of making associations between things Mm -hmm. so yeah and if you ever need creativity just go yeah just go walking walking in downtown Portland because there there are some there are some funny dressed, weird, weirdly dressed people down there, like just all <laughs> sorts of wild things and also art on the walls. Um, like there was this guy with a hatchet going through an orange cone and it, I can't describe it. It's like a, a furry orange cone and then a hatchet going through it. And he was just like casually walking. Everything else was normal. But like <laughs> a furry orange cone and a hatchet <laughs> was, uh, yeah, just like a, a normal Saturday. So I went over to the Saturday market, um, which was a cool market. But uh, no, that does make sense. And and uh, I always I'm always fascinated to hear like people's creative processes because it's almost like there's so much overlap. But then each person as an individual has something that's distinct and and stands out. Um, do you use the internet much? Like, are you on Instagram at all? Like looking at other art for ideas or, um, 
music, movies, don't do anything, any of those kind of activities uh, fuel? fuel sure. It? Yeah. I mean, I, I try to keep my time on social media um, to a minimum. Um, I left Facebook like years ago and mm-hmm. I was a lot happier after I did. I just noticed that. But yeah. like on Instagram, I'm on it here and there, but not all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Pinterest has been a big help for me as far, as far as like kind of finding an aesthetic that I'm looking for. I mean, it's really the algorithm is really good at recognizing sort of this thread of in commonality in an in image and in imagery and like, oh, you're oh, you're looking at all all. Um, silver things right now with um, with this sort of appendage to it. Here's this. Look at these. Look at these. So you kind of find I find this nice flow of ideas through that and I find that it really, it's almost like we're talking about, not to go back to AI, but it's almost like this assistance of like look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And yeah. I, I can sort of like piece together more of what I'm searching for in that way you know what I mean it's been a really yeah. good way for me to like focus my my brain on an aesthetic that I want yeah so yeah. I get inspiration from that I when I work it's as being a a full time artist is wonderful but it's also very very solitary mm-hmm. you know I go days and days where I don't see anybody um, but it's Time in the studio is spent um, listening to music and to podcasts and listening to books for inspiration. Yeah. Watching um, YouTube videos as well. Mm hmm. Um, listening to a lot of music. Um, what kind of music do you listen to? Everything. I've everything? Just, I've been exploring um, a lot of stuff. Like recently, I've been listening to this podcast where these group of um, people go through and they. There's a book called, I think, 1001 Albums That You Must Listen To Before You Die, something uh-huh. like that. And this podcast, this group of people, they go through one by one and listen to each of these albums, and they do a podcast about each one. So I've been listening to that, mm. and as they talk about it, then I'll jump over to my music and like listen to the songs that they're talking about, and that's been a, a great way to sort of deep dive into... A lot of music that I really hadn't heard before, mm-hmm. um, but like it's but it's across the board. Like a, um, I mean, it's just everything. I mean, I listen to metal. I've been listening to um, more rap recently. I've been listening to Cypress Hill for some reason. Been really <laughs> drawn to that. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I just everything really. You know, I uh, like really dark country stuff. Um, um, yeah, I should I should introduce you to my my cousin who lives in West Lynn because he really likes Cypress Hill. Okay, and he also really likes weed. I feel like you, <laughs> you guys would be similar. I, I guess uh, you yeah, guys might get yeah. Along. I think I think four twenty happened this year, and then suddenly I was like, I need to listen to Cypress Hill again. Yeah, and then I just went back <laughs> and I, I did a deep dive and started listening to stuff that I'd never heard from them before. So yeah, that's interesting. It's funny how when you. Because for the longest time I would listen to music as kind of a background thing, but the 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 uh, for me at least it's kind of a practice in intentionally putting all my attention into just listening to music, and how how that changes the experience so much, um, and kind of enriches it. Uh, yeah, like I listened to Pink Floyd, like I I knew like all of the, like the most popular songs. But I never really listened to like their older stuff. Mm-hmm. And a couple of years ago, like I started listening to like the album with the cow on it. I forget what it's called, but there mm-hmm. were just a bunch of songs in it that I'd never heard before, and I really focused on it. And uh, I feel like I feel like if I were to make art, that would be like a very great great source of creativity is just getting a grasp on the culture of different times mm-hmm. and how they talk and the sayings they used and the work, even just like. Yeah, little phrases that they say. Um, yeah. Um, Pink, Pink Floyd. If you have you listened to um, 
Uma Guma yet? I have, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty that's pretty strong. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's pretty powerful. I feel like I just like yeah, if I was making art trying to trying to paint or something, I'd just start like going all over the place (laughs) on the campus. It might look amazing or it might just look awful. Just like so It's a pretty amazing album. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like I haven't asked this question to any artist in particular. Sorry, I'm just checking the audio level. It's like louder than normal right now. Test, test, test. Okay. Um, like the role of drugs in in your creative process. Um, things like caffeine, things like um, uh, the psychedelics, if you've ever taken psychedelics and made art. Uh, I know you were asking me earlier about like if I've ever taken psychedelics. I've taken, um, besides weed, I've, I've experimented with uh, psilocybin mushrooms. And I also tried a couple of times doing the intravenous ketamine, hmm. actually. Um, and those two experiences were very different. And so it kind of opened me up to like the idea, like as obvious as it sounds like different drugs have very different effects on your experience. And so, um, I guess all this I'm prefacing just to say, like, I'm curious if there are any drugs that you've experimented with that have been especially helpful for your creative process and making art. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, limited in terms of what I will touch um, I no longer drink um, my relationship with psilocybin I just decided that I don't want that to be a thing that I could possibly lean on so I just stopped when the pandemic happened um, it wasn't a problem but I didn't want it to potentially become a problem so I just said I don't need it and I just stopped and but I'm strictly psilocybin and cannabis, and I guess caffeine, and I don't, I don't touch anything else. I mean, ayahuasca, I've tried, um, salvia, I've tried many times. But, oh, wow, uh, yeah. But nothing else. Um, I just, I've always known, like, what I'm looking for. Like, I've kind of had a sense of what the path that I want, and anything heavier anything harder than that I know is not really what I it's going to be too much for me and maybe more than I can handle so I just I just stay away from that yeah yeah I think that's definitely like a true thing the, like the cliche that like there are some people who can just like handle substances more and then there's other people who are more sensitive yeah I'm also like that very sensitive to stuff Almost to the point where it's like, I feel like the placebo, like you could give me like a sugar pill and tell me this is like going to give me a crazy experience and I might actually react to it. Mm -hmm. Um, Question, question on the side. Um, You will put this on YouTube. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't worry about getting, um, banned for talking about psychedelics on YouTube? Is that a problem? I don't know. Um, I haven't really thought about that. I think, I think people, oh, you mean talking about the ketamine? I don't know. Like, it, do, is that it, was legal. I did it in a medical office. Okay. And like, yeah. How about the psilocybin? Is, do you think that that's a problem? Um, I mean, I guess I, I guess there's so. there's tons of videos on there about it, so like, yeah, it's probably not a problem. Anyway, I, yeah. just, I just was curious. If it gets banned, that would be unfortunate. I hope that doesn't happen, but it would I feel be. A like I have to like on Instagram. I feel like I have to keep it on the DL. Like I don't need, like if I talk about it, I kind of talk about it in a way that's coded. Like if I'm talking about microdosing, if you type out the word microdosing on Instagram, I feel like you um, you set yourself up for possibly being shadow banned. So if I type microdosing, I misspell it in a way or something like that. Shadow banned as in, they don't ban you, but they put you down on the algorithm? Yeah, it just seems like, it seems like um, your reach becomes more limited maybe when, like I've seen, I don't know if something has changed, but I've seen um, zero growth 
in terms of followers on my Instagram for like well over a year now. It's just been like the same thing, hmm. which is it's fine. But um, I just feel like something like it 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 continued to grow organically over many years, and then it just stopped. And hmm. I feel like it. I don't. Know, I, I I really don't know what happened, but I feel like that that's a something happened with that okay well i'll definitely look into that and maybe cut out sections if need be but i just look at other examples of like popular podcasters like joe rogan and like tim ferris and they talk pretty openly about it okay so i, mean, I don't yeah i don't mind talking about it i just you don't mind talking about it no um, okay. i just don't want to i just don't want you to get to um, have a problem though i appreciate that yeah i think i think i'm my stance on it is kind of like if they want to ban me for something like that they can but I don't see that happening based on the on the other more popular people doing say, saying stuff that in, yeah. seems more descriptive and yeah. <laughs> in detail and stuff um, but yeah on a, on a side note as well I was thinking yeah. about um, like you and I being pulled to Portland um, I felt like Moving from California up to Oregon, um, I felt I kind of felt a bit like my wife and I were sort of pulled out of our life there, and we're kind of pushed into this life here. But I feel like there's something there's something here in Oregon for us, connected to um, that my love for um, psychedelics and the pursuit of mental health through them as well and because it because Oregon has recently legalized them mm-hmm. um, or decriminal, de- decriminalized them yeah um, so I feel like that there's something here there's, it's, this is like a um, a seedbed of something that potentially um, could be something really good here and yeah. Colorado as well Oregon and Colorado seem to have a similar um, attitude towards uh, legalization of certain drugs yeah yeah I agree they do seem like they're both kind of ahead of the uh, curve on decriminalizing stuff hopefully hopefully good examples I know there's a hopefully they set good examples for other states and stuff and and like you're saying I like that that analogy seedbed yeah for the rest of the US mm-hmm. yeah yeah there's a lot of uh, retreat retreat uh centers that i see like popping up yeah. in the oregon area for for uh mushroom related like guided experiences uh, it's, it's nice to be in a state that is on the cutting edge of a new attitude towards psychedelics and um when i think about like the the new cultural zeitgeist um the idea of fungi and mushrooms it's just on everybody's mind now and even <clears throat> even my most square friends or family members know about it now and are like they're curious or asking me about it and sending me sending me things you know like check this out you know um, psilocybin is is in trials now for manic depression or, or whatever you know what I mean mm-hmm. um, so it, it's it's interesting that it how it's become so topical. Mm-hmm. What's been your, uh, can you compare and contrast your experience with, with doing the heavier doses versus the microdosing? Cause I know you said you were experimenting with some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the microdosing is when you are doing that, it, it's, you should not be feeling any of the effects of it. I mean, if, if you if you feel like you are beginning to experience the mushroom, you're taking too much. You know, it's mm. um, it's usually like um, 0.3 to 0.5 grams. I think is a is a proper microdose, and there's there's a way to do it. You're doing it um, in a cycle, like doing it three days, you're doing it four days, and taking a break from it so that you um, break your tolerance you'll develop a tolerance to it and it won't be as effective so you have to take a break from it and then go back on it um and cycle that that way through it mm-hmm. um but 
the microdose, the, the macrodose to me, like I, I, in the past when I've done it, I've done a larger dose. Um, when I, when I, after my mom died, I came back to California and I did a larger dose to kind of really begin to um, open things up, open up to emotions and re- really begin to, um, to grieve for her. So I took a larger dose and then I followed up with um, microdosing after that. I, it's the the larger dose it kind of shows me the territory and the target of what I'm aspiring to heal through the mushroom and then the microdosing just kind of helps me stay there it kind of helps my the microdosing it's, it's almost like it opens you up it's almost like you have um, the password to your OS in here and you can come in and you are more um, you're more open to the suggestion of hey my relationship with alcohol is um, it's becoming problematic maybe I need to deal with that maybe I need to put that aside and deal with my family or whatever you know what I mean mm-hmm. um, but it's the macro is really a, a shock to the system and maybe not for everybody. You know what I mean? I, I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. I, I feel like, for me, I feel like it, it's a rite of passage. Like you, I mean, I, I did it when I was, you know, 18, whatever, 20. And I always thought that everybody else did it too. But, you know, as I grown older and connect with people through social media you know you find that there's a lot of people who've just never even tried it never even thought about it and kind of wonder about it you know it's like it's it may not be for everybody though you know it's I I feel like if you are really on the edge in terms of mental health then it's something you should probably avoid it's something you probably need to deal with in another way Mm -hmm. Um, because it really it takes um it takes some mental resilience to deal with a trip sometimes. And some of, you know, it's, some trips are euphoric. Like I've had, I, I remember when I was in grad school in Tucson and I really got into Coltrane and I was listening to you know, John Coltrane. Mm, the jazz. And, and uh, Love Supreme. Mm. Um, and I was listening to that um, on Mushrooms. And I was just like, oh my God, it's just like, just like the feeling, the euphoric feeling of warmth and love from that, and just like it just you know just connected with that music um, so much. Mm-hmm. But you know, on the other end of that, I've also had experiences that were horrific and really challenging, you know, psychically challenging to to navigate, and you really kind of need to be mentally strong sometimes to take on that thing. Um, or if you're not, then you would probably really want to work with somebody, you know? And that's why I feel like we're kind of on the, in a state that's on the frontier of healing through psychedelics. I feel like that is now a possibility. Because I, you know, going, talking to therapists for years, taking SSRIs for depression, um, I mean, I feel like it's, it's kind of a thing like creatives like if you are a creative person mm-hmm. you are also probably challenged by depression like they just seem to go together for some reason and for me like it, when I was 25 like it suddenly it popped up and suddenly I found myself depressed and and isolated and alone in a situation and it's something that I've you know I've had to battle for for many many years now mm-hmm. um, and any, what I've found is therapy and prescriptions for um, mind-altering SSRIs for, for depression. Um, it's good sometimes in the moment. Um, if, like, if you really need it, it's good. But for me, I never found like it was, it dealt with the deeper things inside you, like the real source and the real root of your pain and trauma. Um, mm. It just never got there for me. Um, and I, I just I just never felt like it was right. And I, but 
the breakthroughs I've made are working with people whose methods are more unorthodox. Their approach is not typical of um, mental health workers and counselors. Um, and I just really had the most amazing breakthroughs working with them and working with psychedelics and microdosing and, and such. And that kind of comes, comes back to our conversation about like doing shadow work. Like that's, I really didn't do, I didn't really work on shadow things until later in life. And when I, you know, after my parents died, a lot of things came up for me, a lot of questions, a lot of emotions, um, a lot of things that I wasn't able to address while they were living. So it just, it just was a really um, radical time for me to try to transition through that. And part of that was like really looking deeply at um, things in my past. And mm. that was, and that's been, you know, it's just, if nothing else, psilocybin is a tool, you know? I mean, my approach to it is that it's something more to me. Like it's, there's, there is something more there. I don't know what it is, but I feel like that there's, it opens, it's, there's a warmth and benevolence that you get through plant medicine that you, I don't find in, say, Wellbutrin or Prozac or whatever. You know mm -hmm. what I mean, like it's yeah. it's not there. It's that is a more mechanical way. It works, but it's a more mechanical way of dealing with things versus I don't know. It's just like my relationship with the mushroom. It's a mentor. It's a teacher. Um, it knows me. It challenges me. Um, it tells me when I'm wrong in a way. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. And I don't get that with pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I agree. I've experimented with not pharmaceuticals, although I've been recommended several times with like SSRIs and stuff, but, but like 5-HTP, which is also affects the serotonin system, but it's over the counter and other, other supplements like that. There's a really popular podcaster now, uh, Andrew Huberman. Mm -hmm who's the Stanford um, professor of, of neuroscience and, and he like talks about supplements and stuff and has helped me with experimenting with those things. And I kind of feel like those are a middle ground between something like an SSRI or like a mood stabilizer, antipsychotic type thing mm -hmm. and like uh, just doing nothing or just trying to like do some type of behavioral thing like meditate or journal. Yeah. So like a supplement like 5-HTP is like a milder SSRI in a way. And when I do those things to help to try to help with my own, uh, you know, anxiety or something like that or stress, it uh, it's like a band aid. So I kind of can I can relate to your experience of, of the SSRI. Not not really. It's being like a mechanical solution, almost like it's going like control alt push this emotion away like <laughs> yeah. on the keyboard of your brain. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good analogy. But then it's just going to come come right back up. And so. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, I feel like that's a common thing. I, 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 everyone that I've talked to, not to say that that's true for everyone, but just everyone that I've talked to, it seems like for me, meds are, are not the answer for a lot of people, or let's just say they're over prescribed, but definitely some people it works for. Um, yeah, you mentioned, I just, I can't, I can't help but think that you're you're you were born in california i know i said it, i made the mistake earlier just because um you're so into this stuff but you're actually from kansas what's <laughs> the what's the stance on on psychedelics there i mean obviously when you were a kid probably like they didn't even know what it was right or or no they probably did but they were against it oh i mean they're it's it's all illegal in kansas yeah 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 um, like, like, what you, are you asking me how do Kansans feel about psychedelics, or what do you what are you asking me? Um, no, I don't know. I guess I'm just like curious, like how how growing up in Kansas, and then you moved to Arizona, and then you were in California, and now you're here in Oregon. 
like, um, I guess more generally, just like how, how did living in those areas like, uh, affect who you are, you think, or like shape who you are? Cause those first 20 or 15, 20 years of living in an area is not really in our control. Right. But, but that's just kind of where we're born and we live unless, unless, unless someone's moving around a lot. And so that area kind of shapes someone without them really consciously knowing that they're being shaped by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. But you seem like you've outgrown, I mean, unless you secretly have like some like wooden pipe and like, uh, I don't know what Kansas people have, you know, (laughs) (laughs) secretly have like a Dorothy, uh, collection, like. I don't even, I don't even, I don't even have any cliches to reference. I mean, there's like agriculture there, right? And that's oh, yeah. a big thing. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, the Wizard of Oz is, is a huge part of um, my mythology, like my personal mythology. And even when my wife and I got married, um, she wore these amazing, I think they were Vivian, Vivian Westwood, these red um, sparkly shoes. Um, that look that look like the ruby slippers from uh, Wizard of Oz. Oh wow! So you do have some some Kansas roots alive in you still. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. There's there's this. I think Midwesterners are a certain type of people, um, and that and that's still in me for sure. You know, there's a mm-hmm. um, there's oftentimes a a genuineness and a kindness about Midwestern people that um, I really adore. Um, you know, there's certain things that, you know, I, I, mean, I, I left Kansas and went west for a reason. I wanted to be more challenged, you know. I wanted to see more things. I wanted to sort of broaden my perspective because I just, I, I was living in this sort of smallish college town, um, which was wonderful, but hmm. I just, it, I outgrew it artistically and I just wanted to see more. So I moved west to Arizona and then I moved west again to California. And now I guess we're going north. (laughs) Yeah. Let's see here. If you could return to your 25 year old self, what advice would you give them for um, pursuing art? Because it seems like you, since a very early age, you were very artistically driven and that was kind of the thing for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Would you recommend anything to your younger self in terms of um, practices or attitudes to have? I don't know, maybe um, just more patience. Um, I mean, when I, when I look back over the past, say 20, 30 years um, of me becoming an artist, um, there's, there's peaks and valleys. There's um, good times and bad times. Um, and you know, what I've taken away from my experience working with the mushroom as well is an attitude that everything is part of the whole. Um, whether your experience is good or bad, everything is shaping you into who you become. And I really can't, I can't negate any of it. I can't say I wish I'd done that differently because it's, you know, even the most the hardest things, the most traumatic moments have had a strong influence in pushing me in this direction, pushing me off in this direction. I feel like one something like if, if you're going to be an artist, you have to really want it. You need you know, you need to you need to really feel that need and that connection to it. Um, and to t- to take on that life means sometimes it means giving up other things um it means being selfish with your time it means you know 
you want your studio time and it means sometimes not seeing other people as well um but just understanding that 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 sort of commitment to what you're taking on um was that a hard was that a hard choice even then like in your like early 20s as you were exiting art school i mean a common thing that some people in in that thing uh situation do is they kind of i don't want to say settle because individuals have different values but they go into something that's creative but more of a sure thing like marketing or uh, graphic design or something like that mm -hmm. was that a hard decision for you at that point or did it feel like a big decision when you were like no i'm going to do independent art you know oddly enough um i never thought of anything else i never considered doing anything else i think that when i was really young i mean i was i was making art from a very young age i was making things out of clay i was constantly drawing i was you know i was I mentioned going to church. I would go to church, but I would draw in church the entire time. So, so you know, so our pastor had drawings of him that I had made or whatever. But, and my mother saved everything. So, like, we just moved here. So I've been going through old family stuff and, like, old drawings that I did when I was five years old of vampires and all these different things. But my point is, is that I just was always making art. I was always being creative. Um... You know, just it was it was never shunned in my house. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily encouraged, mm -hmm. and my parents really weren't creative people. They just they didn't really do that. Mm -hmm. They didn't really get it. But I was lucky enough that they didn't really stand in the way either. They didn't really say, "Oh, you got to do something that where you that's more stable, where you make you know where you make a steady income." Mm -hmm. um, they're just like, "That's what he does." You know, that's his thing. And that's what he's going to do. So that's really uh, a great thing to have both your parents, at the very least, not them saying you can't do that. Yeah, I think that's that's huge, and uh, kind of surprising. I mean, I didn't know your father, but just I just picture someone who's deeply religious and a father figure from some somewhere like Kansas, Midwest, or the South probably being more like no you're going to be this or that you're going to be a lawyer or a, you're going to work uh on the farm or something you know take over the family business they had so. a very strong idea of who i was supposed to be and i didn't fit into that box very well um i mean you can see me now like a like mm -hmm. like my folks did not get me mm -hmm. growing up you know i was definitely kind of a an odd one to them um, but like I say, I was lucky that they, they just kind of stood back and said, okay, I'm let, we're gonna let him do his thing. Um, you know, he wants to pursue art, you know, they did, they did not get it. Mm -hmm. They did not understand it. They just were not, um, they just weren't interested in art, but you know, they just, they let me do it and they supported me, um, you know in any way they could. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the, in the uh, previous interview that you had done that uh, the passing of your parents was something that kind of allowed you to finally kind of become an adult or like become it's like the final step of really becoming like a, an individual who, who's not who's not really responsible to anyone. Like you can truly be independent to yourself. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that and like what that was like and what you mean by that? It was a real rite of passage. Um, and my dad went fairly quickly. Um, and I mean, oddly enough, both my parents died in hospice. Both of them died in the same room, in the same bed, but about five years apart and my dad died of kidney failure and he was in hospice for about eight days and I was there with him and you know I had all the time in the world to be with him and say goodbye and I mean it was it was it was difficult but it was also very wonderful at the same time and I 
I just had, had the greatest closure because he and I didn't really see eye to eye. You know, like I'm mentioning, like I'm from I'm from Kansas, but um, I'm definitely I don't really look like I'm from Kansas, and I don't really <laughs> I think a little bit differently. I think so. We he and I were at odds. You know, I always like through high school I dressed alternative, and I was wearing like combat boots and trench coats and things like that to school, and my dad was not into that at all, and. You know, he did not want to see me dressing like that. Um, I, kind of, I kind of lost my train of thought. Can you, re can you repeat the question again? No, no worries. I was just curious about, about like... Um, what you meant exactly by feeling like you are now and an, an individual, like a true adult and, oh, and, yeah. and the process of, of that. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So, it, so I was talking about the, the passing of my parents and they, they both died in hospice about five years apart. Um, it was and I'm their only son. So it was, it was a pretty crazy time. It, all the responsibility <clears throat> fell on my shoulders to deal with the death. And then my mother had Alzheimer's at the time. So then I had to step in and take care of her and watch her deteriorate over about five years with Alzheimer's and begin to sort of fade away mentally. Um, so that, so it, it just really was a, a real... Um, I mean, I describe it almost as a hero's journey in a way. Like it was a real trial to get through that, particularly with my mom, and to watch her deteriorate and to deal with um, taking care of her as she needed more and more care, and then to finally to finally have her in a place where she was in hospice and she was going to pass away too. And I, like I said, I had that. I had a moment. I had I had this moment both with my dad and with my mom to find that final closure. With them, and it was really an amazing experience um, to help them both pass on. Um, but what I found after that, I just it just it felt like a final um, rite of passage into adulthood in a way. Like losing your losing your parents is like that last thing. It's like okay, now I am, I'm alone in the world. Like for me, I don't have brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my folks were, like most of their family's gone too. So it's just kind of me now, um, mm -hmm. which is really weird. But like I said, like it's just this thing where you really have to step up. You know, you go from being, you go from being, from them being the parents and you being the child to suddenly the roles revert shift and suddenly they become more childlike as they get older and they can't take care of themselves and you have to take on a really heavy burden and a lot of responsibility. So it just really, um, like I say, like every experience shapes you, whether it's a good experience or bad experience. And I just felt like going through the death of both my parents was such a a sharp tool in shaping me into who I've become in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that's still affecting you now. It must have been a very really powerful experience. Yeah, it's have. something yeah, it's something that I've feared for a long, long time because I like I say, it was just, you know, my parents and I were close. They stayed together. They although they fought a lot, but they yeah. stayed together. So we were like a unit, we were like a trinity, we were a unit of three. And um, yeah, the dynamic of the family just began to deteriorate and erode as health, as their health went down. And I just, I had to step in more and more because they were in denial of it, like they weren't gonna leave the house and they weren't gonna get more care. And it just, it just was, um, it just really meant stepping up and taking care of business. 
And how did the mushrooms help with that after after um, the passing of your parents? You said that you took a, a very a relatively large dose of, of mushrooms. How did that help with your the uh, process of becoming like a full full adult and, and kind of accepting that you were the last one of, of that side of the family really you know because that is a huge kind of position to be in I mean, a big transition Ch- mm. chapter is ending and a new one is beginning yeah um yeah i mean the, the experience just it just helped me move with the grieving process and to begin to sort of put things in place and to uh, I don't know, to emotionally mature to step up to be um, I don't know it's hard to describe but it's, it's, I mean, yeah. it's it, a lot of personal dynamics between my folks and I like it it was it was really it was hard, but it was a really in the end it was really a marvelous way to part with them, and it mm-hmm. and it just meant that um, that I got to take on a role that really empowered me with them, but also it gave me a sense of like great love because I was also there to be with them mm-hmm. as they died. And I was able to show them affection, appreciation as a son for the life they'd given me. The other thing I'll say about that, um, when my dad was dying, like I said, he was, um, he was religious all of his life and became more religious as he, as he got older. And I mean, he was, he was a great guy. He was, um, <clears throat> he didn't, he didn't always get it, you know what I mean? He was a little bit, he was kind of conservative in his thinking about certain things. and um, but, he, but he, when he was in hospice and passing away, and I was, I was there with him, and I was trying to sort of give him an experience um, that, he would, that he would feel comfortable with. Like I, I brought my iPad, and I was playing his favorite gospel songs that, that he would sing, or I, I was playing, like he got to the point where he could no longer speak, like as, as he was having kidney failure, so it was affecting his mind and he couldn't, he could no longer speak, but he could kind of react. And I, then I was playing songs that he used to sing to me and that he would, we would, he would change the words and make it funny. And like, I would play this for him in hospice and he would giggle, you know? So mm-hmm. I knew that he was like getting it. Mm-hmm. And, um, but before he had lost the abilities to speak, he, he kind of pulled me in close and he said, you know, I need to speak to you. I need to know where you're at in your faith. You know, and I, had, I haven't gone to church with him in 30 some years or so, I don't know, longer even. Um, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's been a long, long time mm-hmm. since I've, I've really gone to church with them. And he just wanted to know where I was at with that. and I. You know, I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's what do you tell a dying man? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put my foot down and say, I'm not a believer. You know what I mean? I yeah. I just I told him I said I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on this. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. that in a way that was kind of a um, it's kind of a vow to him in a way for me to reconsider um, my relationship with. Um, the spirituality that was available available to me before. Um, like I said, I, I take the best and leave the rest. I take certain things about it, you know. Um, I mean, one, I'm going off on a tangent. A no, bit, please. But, um, one thing that I, I've begun to miss and appreciate is the idea of like a daily blessing, you know. I don't really say... I don't really say grace, but every day I do consider in my mind, I think about in the same way that you might pray and you might say thank you to God for certain things. I consider every day I think about what I'm blessed with, you know, and to me that is, that's the mushroom. 
the mushroom is helping me to, you know, to take away the dark filters and to see things with a clear lens and to find gratitude in what I have because I really have so much. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like I, I, there are moments in my life that were very challenging, but I'm very happy for those challenges because it's brought me to the place that I am now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those. Yeah, I don't. I don't have much to add to that. Really, it's just. A, <laughs> but yeah, thank you for sharing. That was really uh, beautiful and insightful. And yeah, that is. It's. It's. It really is true that the. It's hard to. Regret is such a. Is such a difficult emotion because it can arise sometimes but then you know who's to say that an experience is negative or positive truly because you only have where you're at right now and and that experience if it's negative might push you in a direction if it's positive might push you in another direction which will have certain causal cause effect you know reactions later yeah that it's it's kind of a silly thing to try to even um calculate and yet our minds seem to want to yeah all right so we're kind of towards the end now these last few questions are really just kind of fun ones and then the last one's really just about your um art but uh, uh if you could have lunch with one artist dead or alive who would that be and what do you think you'd ask them? Oh my God, wait, that's such a big question. <laughs> <laughs> it's something like I've never thought about before. Um, I mean, I think about um, more filmmakers, like watching um, interesting films or films that are more um, uh, uh, cult favorites. Um, have you seen Have you seen the film um, Holy Mountain? Alejandro. Is it a comedy? Hadarowski. It's um, It's a lot of things. It's oh, okay. Many things. It was made in I want to say probably late sixties, early seventies. Um, it is a it's very psychedelic Hmm. very odd um, hard to describe Um, it's just it's like this story of this sort of Christ like figure it takes place partially in Mexico and um, it seems to be like this commentary on capitalism and the Catholic Church and commodification but it's 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 sort of a commentary on many things on mm-hmm. many levels and it is just so odd and trippy um, so he's an inter- interesting character I think he's still alive um, Alejandro Hadarowski I think is how you say his name oh yeah I'm familiar with that name okay yeah he also um, was I guess I think he was doing art design for Dune um, at one point the da- the David Lynch Dune um, I think maybe prior to that actually um, there's a documentary about that and I'm and it slips my mind but I want to say maybe he was initially going to direct it and there was a whole um, there was a whole aesthetic and idea that he put together for what this was going to be what this film was going to be Mm -hmm. Um, and then it didn't get made and then I guess it went to David Lynch instead or something like that oh I see but I would I would have I would really be curious to see and to know like more about 
how he would have done that and his interpretation, like based on the films that he made in the, in the seventies that were just so far out there. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm a big fan of his. I'm also a big fan of, um, um, I think his name is John Borman. John Borman directed, um, he did Deliverance. Did you ever see that? That sounds super familiar. That was like post 2000, right? It was probably from maybe 73, 1973. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm confusing it with something else then. Very, very old. Oh, okay. Um, he did Deliverance. He did um, Excalibur mm -hmm. um, from the early 80s. And he also did a film called Zardos, which is so odd and so good. <laughs> Um, it's Sean Connery had been doing Bond films for a long time. Do you know who I mean? By Sean mm -hmm. Connery. Yeah. He was doing Bond films for a long time and then that ended and I guess he wanted to do something very different and this was very different. Mm -hmm. um, it's this interesting, so Zardos is this interesting dystopian um, vision of the future um, where you have these people who live eternal lives they, they live forever they're immortal but they live in these bubbles um, mm -hmm. separated from um, the outside world the outside world outside of the dome is um, the brutals and the brutals are kind of like the the gardeners who keep the population down where they're like they're like they, they're killers essentially um, but Sean Connery is one of the brutals um, these sort of barbaric creature, uh, figures on the outside and he f figures out how to penetrate into the dome and enters into the world of these immortals and he becomes like almost like this virus there that sort of wakens them up to this other realization and they they have become so um, bored with their lives, like they've fallen into complete apathy. Like there's these apathetics who just are just, they just kind of do nothing. They just kind of like wander around just out of their mind from apathy. So it's a really, it's just a really weird, weird <laughs> film. It sounds very weird um, in a good way. But it's so good. It's so, I just, I just, I don't know. I, I would love to have a conversation with John Borman. I would love to have a conversation with Alejandro Hadarowski. Um those are a couple of my favorites. Mm. Um, I don't know. I guess I, a lot of my work has been influenced by um, 1970s sci-fi films. It's kind of when I was really growing up and really looking at that stuff and absorbing it. So and a mm -hmm. lot of it, a lot of the storylines during that era was looking at the world through, you know, it, um, sort of beginning to look at the world as if it's not going to last, you know, we're heading for disaster, particularly we're heading, you know, in the 70s, we began to think about um, our relationship with nature and um, a growing energy crisis. And we began to look at that um, through dystopian films, like thinking about, okay, this environment, we're going to we're going to mess up this environment and we're going to have to move inside of these bubbles, these domes to sort mm -hmm. of separate us from these really harsh environments. Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of idea is present in like the weird film like Zardos. You see that in Logan's Run. They live in this city um, in these domes separated from the outside world. The outside world is poison and they're not to go out. Um, but they also control population you can only live at 35 and when you get to 35 then you are you are supposedly renewed like you are destroyed but you're supposedly reborn somewhere else but anyway hmm. and these and these it sort of looks at like darker futures and living yeah. particularly like relationships with the environment and living in dome worlds that's really influenced um it's where like a lot of the domes are coming from um it's the dome is Clear domes are like um, this sheltered world from a more feral world outside, um, but they're also um, 
an homage to the mushroom shape. You know, obviously mushrooms. Um, mm-hmm. They're worlds that are preserved, or sort of Eden-like gardens. Sometimes inside of these domes, on resting on the shoulders of of Mary. You know. Mm-hmm. Do you have anything you'd want to ask them, or are you just be curious what they? Uh, yeah, what would you want to talk to them about? You know, I don't know. I I'm, I never know what to say to people. Would <clears throat> you be starstruck a bit? I always am. I yeah. I my wife and I um, were in the airport several years ago, and we were um, we through the luck of her job we were in first class and we mm. were like up in the first class lounge and Billy Idol was there and my oh, wife wow. and I were like oh, that's <laughs> Billy Idol. you know but and I like I I went to the restroom and I walked right past him you know and I just you know I wanted I wanted to say like I know you and I know, <laughs> like and I know I know your history and I know like I know your first band, I know Generation X, and I loved that in high school, but like I just, like you say, Star Trek, I can't talk to uh, people. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't say anything, I just like, hey. Yeah. So I guess to answer your question, I don't know what I would ask, but I would just love to sit down with these people and just um, absorb what they have to say. Um. Not to open up a total new subject, um, just for the sake of time, just because I'd like to wrap up in the next 15 or so. And I just have one other uh, question after this. But I'm, I'm curious, since we were talking about the shadow earlier, um, which kind of, it, it, it does connect with like the idea of like uh, subconscious, the subconscious and, and ideas like that. Um, do you have a strong relationship with your dreams? And what's that like? Um, it's weird because it has, it's really evolved for me over time. When I was um, <clears throat> when I was in art school in my early 20s, I had a lot of dreams. And I kept a dream journal somewhere. It's packed away with... I have lots of journals packed away somewhere. And within that, there's like slips of paper, like rant, stuff I would just grab in the middle of the night to write down dreams. Um, but as of more recent years, like the past decade or so, um, I definitely dream. I definitely hit REM state and, and go through dreams, but I don't remember them much anymore. And a lot of them, like I was saying, like after my parents died, a lot of things have come up, like have surfaced, and some there's some things from my past that have kind of surfaced, and I tend to have a lot of um, I have a lot of PTS dreams, like a lot of dreams where I wake up screaming and wake up sweaty. Um, mm. I unfortunately wake up kicking sometimes, and my wife gets kicked in the middle of the night, so. Um, my dreams are hopefully not too hard. They're restless, for sure. They're yeah. restless, um, and I have um, I have a lot of reoccurring dreams, and I I don't know why, but I have this one reoccurring dream about Japan, and I've been to Japan. My wife and I went there in 2019, but before that, I was having this dream where it was like a frustration dream where I'm. I'm trying to get to the airport and I can't find my passport or I'm going to be late for the plane or whatever. Like it's, so it's just like trying, I don't know, trying to get there. And it, it's just been a reoccurring thing for a long time. And I went to Japan and came back and it went away for a while, but I'm getting them again. I also had, um, when I was living in Kansas, I was having a lot of tornado dreams, dreams about tornadoes. I was mm-hmm. writing those down. And I kept having them until probably about 1993. I was still living in Kansas at home, and there was a tornado that came through very close to our town. Oh, wow. And I was at home with my mom, and we were down in the shelter, and you could, like, you could hear it outside. And after it, it kind of seemed like it went away. Like it seemed like it had dissipated, and I ran 
upstairs and to see what was going on. You could see the sky was like um, it was like the color of a bruise. It was like purplish blue, mm-hmm. and it was churning. And I could see a tornado, like the the energy was dissipating and it was like pulling itself up in the cloud. And just like it was like a tail like finishing itself off, but it was incredible. And this is real life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you think that dream was a premonition then? No, no, yeah. Um, no, I, I never dreamed about tornadoes again after that, though. Like, that kind of, like, that closed that chapter. Interesting. After seeing the tornado. Very interesting. Um, final question here for you. Uh, it's kind of a hypothetical, but a, um, a mother is teaching her uh, son about art, let's say, 100 years from now, and uh, your art uh, comes up in in this book covering kind of like 21st century artists mm-hmm. what would be most satisfying to you um, to have it say as kind of your your lasting you know some people don't value don't really care much about their legacy in, in the art world but just for the sake of what you'd be remembered for what do you think would would be most satisfying for the impact of your art um, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> my feeling about it usually is that <clears throat> I have a certain amount of control over these things while the work is in my studio. I make um, aesthetic choices and I determine the overall form and shape and, and material and whatnot. And I sort of, I sort of choose the metaphor. What it's what it's suggesting, what it's saying, mm-hmm. and I sort of do that with a soft brush. You know what I mean? Like it's not blatant, but there is definitely a communication happening there. You know, there's something talking about our relationship with with nature, with um, taking resources from nature, and what nature means to us. What nature, I, I guess. Long story short, I would say that um, you know, so once I put something out there in the world, um, it's kind of up to it's up to who's looking at that work, how they want to see it, how they want to take that in, yeah. and how they want to think about that in their in in the context of their own life. You know yeah, I mean? it's and I I really appreciate that like when I'm using I grew up in a Protestant based religion but we definitely focused on the cross and we focused on Mary and and things like that so so Mary has certain meanings to me but it for me it's interesting like putting taking um, a Catholic image and then turning it into more of a mushroom and how that connects with people who grew up Catholic and who were sort of have reconsidered that path a little bit, but they, mm-hmm. you know, they. I think a lot of people now are rethinking their connection to their spirituality, and people who have experienced have a psychedelic experience are able to see that connection between that spirituality and. Um, between nature now and they're sort of like bringing those two things together I think that you, yeah I think that in decades to come you will see more of a revival of spirituality but maybe one that integrates um, psychedelics into that more so like I think that people are hungry for this feeling of belonging in the universe like for me if I for I don't know, um for me, being atheist for years, it wasn't mm-hmm. very satisfying. Like it yeah. really, I, I really like to feel like I'm connected to the universe in some way, you know? And I think that's, I think, I think that, that that message is put into my work as well. Um, but to answer your question, I guess, I want people to look at the work and to feel that connection that I'm feeling um, 
through the lens of psychedelics to the rest of the world. Um, mm-hmm. And I want my work to feel hopeful to people. I'm trying to put images out that are that give people hope. That say, you know, this is this is a new way of looking at things. This mm-hmm. is a new lens. This is a lens that maybe you haven't tried before, but maybe you really should. Yeah, it, it's always interesting to me. Like I, I know I have a lot of family friends that are baby boom, baby boomers. They're in their seventies and eighties mm-hmm. now, and you know, and that's that that generation was the first generation to try psychedelics. You know, they ushered in that whole hippie movement. Yeah, some of them did, mm-hmm. but some of them didn't. And I like growing growing up in Kansas. I have family members who are adamantly opposed to any sort of cannabis use yeah. or you know god forbid you you would mess around with like um mushrooms or something like that you know, yeah that's, that's, that would just be crazy yeah but, but you know but i i i just know that i could blow their mind with one with mu- one mushroom tea you know if we just had a little bit of tea together mm-hmm. um we could probably rethink the way they look at the world, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, I just feel like it's something that it's like a rite of passage. You know, I just I I wouldn't want to leave this earth without um, connecting t- um, to nature, to the universe, in the way that you do through a psychedelic experience. Yeah. No, definitely. I think that was a. Uh a really great explanation I think you, I think I think that would be perfect yeah just have no really just like the idea of your art having an impact of reconnecting you know people with like that spiritual side that like some people maybe don't even know that they're missing in their life um, in the nature as well you know so there's a it, I feel I feel an obligation I feel that the mushroom has done a great deal for me as far as um, personal healing, as far as being an image that I'm using in my work to create a message. So I, I also feel like I, I owe a debt in a way. So then mm-hmm. I want to be a positive representative of, of that sort of thing. I want people to rethink how they look at psychedelics, you know? Like mm-hmm. you know I'm saying, like the boomers that I know from the Midwest, you know, um, I'm not going to change their minds, but um, a psychedelic experience would certainly change the way they look at the world. I think. Yeah, I know I said it earlier, but really, I I do believe like you're playing a, a part, wh- whether you realize it or not, with your art in the in the movement that's happening. Um, so, yeah, that's great, and. Uh, yeah, Michael Michael Campbell, thank you for taking the time again for for being on the show. My pleasure, William. Yeah. Uh, can you tell people who are interested in, in like knowing where to find your your art? You're represented by Eden Gallery primarily and they're located in San Francisco. By Modern Eden Gallery. Modern Eden Gallery. Modern Eden Gallery, yeah. Um, so primarily um, working with them right now. Mm-hmm. Great. And it, do you happen to know their their website or off the top of your head or, or their Instagram or something like that? Um, or if people if people internet internet searched you know Modern Eden they'd probably find it Modern Eden in San Francisco. It's it's either Modern Eden or Modern Eden Gallery. Um, okay. One of those. Great. And then on Instagram and and where else can people find your your uh, work or like where you live on on the internet. I mean, I'm really kind of, I'm only on Instagram right now. You're pretty minimal. Yeah. yeah you're really, just, it seems like you're really just focused on your work. Yeah. I, I just, I try to um, limit my relationship with technology sometimes. Like I want to be, I want to be hands-on and in studio working mostly. Yeah. So Instagram is Michael Campbell. Michael Campbell Art. Mm-hmm. Michael Campbell Art. Great. And Campbell is C-A-M-P-B-E-L-E. A P E L L, okay, yep. like the soup. That's right. Okay, <laughs> Michael Campbell. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Michael. Thank you, Will. It's a yeah. pleasure.